Tonight's reading is Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jill. Ooh la la. I think it's a new Anglican response. We should have it put into the book, shouldn't we? I say praise the Lord and you all say... Hallelujah. We're rocking it, aren't we? Let's pray together on this Vision Sunday. Heavenly Father, as we have already sung, we are here for you. We've celebrated your goodness already this evening. We're here for you. We are your church. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, earlier this year, um, just before the summer, Charlotte Herlow, who uh, comes to our 915 service, recommended a book to me, and it was called Wild by Cheryl Strayed. Has anyone read it? No hands. Um, it's a good book. I give it a 7 out of 10. It's about uh, this lady's account of her 1,100-mile personal pilgr- pilgrimage, can get my teeth in, to find healing and peace as she walked the Pacific Crest Trail of Western America. That's a long walk to try and sort your head out. Um, I personally, oh gosh, I love a story about pilgrimage. Um, reading about how people do the most remarkable things in order to find wholeness and peace um, by taking the strangest journeys, sometimes um, with really no fruit. Um, A couple of the others I've enjoyed, Raina Wynn's Salt Path. Anyone enjoyed that one? Yeah, that's quite a bestseller. She walked the Southwest Coast Path, close to my heart, uh, along with a very poorly husband, trying to sort of sort it all out. Or my my favourite, Tony Hawk's, I I get this from Amazon, actually no, don't get Amazon, Amazon's evil isn't it, Um, get it from a a, a local bookshop, Um, it's about a man who takes a miniature pig and a basket on the front of a bike and cycles across Devon, how cool does that sound? (laughs) To try and sort your head out, Um, journeys with a purpose, as random as they may be, always fascinate me. Um, On our last Vision Sunday, uh, which was earlier in the year, The theme was also about journeys, about how ours, we reflected back at that point, both personally and as a church, had been continually rerouted and altered during those awful COVID years that we're trying to forget about now. Um, But today on Vision Sunday, once again, we look forward as we launch into a new academic year, we're already in October, uh, a new season. And this is always a busy term for us, particularly as a church. 
I sense the Lord wants us to look again at our ongoing journey as a church, our pilgrimage, if you like, our journey with a meaning. Our overarching vision, of course, you will all remember. Um, I use the picture of a three-legged stool to help us um, remember it. Um, three key aims and values that we have as a church as we meet together, summed up by the three legs of the stool. The first one is to love God, upward relationship with him. That's our life of devotion and worship of the Lord, getting to know him better it's why, for example, we did 24-4 uh, earlier this term, four days of continuous prayer. We almost manage continuous prayer, not quite. We can do better, and we will try again. We were responding uh, to the call of the Lord to pray more, to spend more time with him, to invest more in that relationship, to listen, to tell him what we're thinking, to read his word, to worship so prayer is really important. Um, and it's also why over the last few months, uh, some members of the PCC, the staff team, in reflecting on what our, our priorities for the coming season, we've really sensed, um, it sort of has all come together as we've prayed and chatted, that there's this sense that the Lord is calling us deeper in our journey as disciples of Christ, our journey of discipleship. He wants us to invest more in that area. It's a key part of our journey going forward. So that's just loving God, our upwards relationships with him. It's the bedrock of all we do. The second leg of the stool, uh, second point, is how we love each other, our sidewards relationships with one another, sharing lives, sharing faith, prayers, and love within the church community. And obviously, home groups are a key place to do this. If you're not part of a home group, I really encourage you to be part of one. Um, it's where we build the real relationships with each other, where we can share what's actually going on in our lives in ways that you just can't do on Sundays, and the way we can support one another through those relationships as well. As someone was just telling me earlier before the service of a way that one home group is responding to a need. It's where those, those things in our life, we get the support and love that we really need. It's also why, as a church, we're refreshing our pastoral care structure. You might not even know that we had a pastoral care structure. Um, COVID sort of threw a lot of the way we used to do things into a little bit of flux, and so we're sort of refreshing it. Um, just basically a structure to enable us to look after each other better. So all of us involved, because it isn't just a clergy thing, this is uh, the biblical model is, is the body of Christ all playing their part. We loving each other, helping each other, but when there are things that go a little bit more wrong than usual and you need a bit more support than the support structures there. So we'll gradually be introducing that to our pastoral team and home group leaders over the coming weeks, investing in loving each other, that sidewards relationship with one another. And then the third leg of the stool, three legs, uh, is to love the world. You knew that, I know. My, famous, my, fa my favorite quote, which I quote um, far too often, is by a former Archbishop of Canterbury quite a long time ago, William Temple. He said, the church is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. Amen. Um, we all understand that. It's for the people who aren't here, loving the world. We share his love with the world around us through our actions and our words. It's such an important part of what we do. Individually, when we all leave here and go about all the things that we do um, for the rest of the week, um, and corporately, when we gather together for special initiatives or certain ministries that the church runs. And this is a great term for getting out there. I'm really excited by all that's coming up. When we can go out together wearing our lovely blue bobble hats or sweatshirts or T-shirts, whatever we've got. Um, we've got the light trail in uh, two weeks, three weeks, a few weeks. Uh, sign up. Don't forget before you go, if you can help. Hundreds of people in our local community will be on the streets and we get to welcome them, to love them, to have fun with them. Amazing opportunity. And also all of our Christmas services coming up as well where we get to go out to the shopping centre and do stuff. We also get to welcome people in. Massive privilege Christmas is as a, a church like this where we can actually love and show our love and share good news with the people in our community. So reaching out through those kind of activities, but also our compassion ministries, um, where we can put into practice some of what we've recently been challenged about in uh, the mini-series we have on living justly. So that's three legs of the stool, loving God, upwards, loving each other, loving the world. 
Um, they all are at the core of who we are. Chris Parrott recently, is Chris here? There you go. Thank you, Chris, for this uh, little sermon tip. Um, he explained to me recently why a milking stool or a three-legged stool has three legs. Why three and not four? Uh, you may know this if you're an engineer or the scientist, you know, scientist kind of brain. Uh, it's because three legs provide stability on even ground. Did you know that? You all knew that. It was just me who didn't. I was really thinking about that, though. I thought, what a brilliant picture that God has given us about our vision, because actually, you, we need to be, uh, provide stability in an unstable world, and the church, with those three things strongly in place, provide great stability, loving God, loving each other, loving the world in equal measure. That's who we're called to be. And so on this uh, Vision Sunday, I, I sense the Lord reminding us again that our, pers- our purpose and our pilgrimage, if you like, is to follow him as a church and be committed to that as disciples of Christ. Of course, being church, we're having a nice time tonight. I'm really enjoying myself. Um, but church sometimes can be challenging. Let's face it. It's very countercultural for a start. The gospel calls us to move contrary to the world and society around us to take the opposite direction on a lot of things that we do and the things that we believe. And the church generally gets very bad press because of a lot of things. They generally don't like the Christian church, um, the press. And to be honest, even us as Christians, we can be pretty down on our own church at times as well. Church is challenging. It's challenging. But it's unsurprising if you think about it that that's the case, because one of the most important things that we are called to be is also going to be one of the most contested things to be. And the devil does not like things that raise Jesus' names high, transforms lives, brings light into darkness. So we are often contested from inside and out, but we have to hold firm. You might remember, belong to a football club or a chess club or a pizza club or a tiddlywinks club or whatever club you can fill it in. Um, it might seem far easier than being part of the church because they're all social gatherings where you just go for fun. And we are social and we do have fun. But we are home to the presence and power of God in church. And that's a completely different dynamic. That's the church. Nothing else has the power to transform lives and communities than the astonishing, loving, holy, gracious, generous presence of God that we find here when we gather together as his body, Jesus' body, the body of Christ. Where else would you want to be? Probably watching Strictly Come Dancing results, but we'll finish soon, don't worry. Uh, We'll be home for that. Um, The writer of Psalm 84 sums it up. I think it's a great psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The the psalmist here writes from a deep call to want to praise and worship and be in God's presence. And that is what we experience in church together, God's presence with us. Jesus himself only actually mentioned church on a couple of occasions in the gospel. He recorded, sorry, as he uh, spoke, it was recorded uh, in the gospels in Greek, and the word that he used is ecclesia, ecclesia. Most helpfully, I think, in Matthew 16, where we see a dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus famously asked them, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, one of the disciples, answered him. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Amazing conversation. But the question there, who do you say I am, Jesus asks. It's probably the most important question that we personally answer during our own lives. And Simon Peter there replies with a revelation. His answer is a revelation, and it's the revelation on which Jesus would then go on to build his church. That's what it says. The revelation on which the church is built is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
So the church, us, we are those who see who Jesus really is, those who confess Jesus as Lord of our lives and live our lives accordingly. If somebody or something is Lord of your life, then everything is underneath that. Jesus is Lord. And ecclesia, actually, in the Greek word, it means to be called out or called together. The English word, interestingly, we use for church, um, it's where language gets complicated, originates from a German word that or originates from another Greek word, which means of the Lord. But if you throw all that together, it basically means we're called out together to be people of the Lord, people who have Jesus as their Lord. 1 John 4 says, we love because he first loved us. It starts with his love. It's all about his love. And our motivation, our whole reason for being here as church is Jesus, who is love. That's why our uh, vision statement, our three legs of the stool are love, love, love. It's about love. Be love. So he is intimately involved with us, Jesus, who is love. And that Jesus said, I will build my church. I'll be at the center of it. He didn't say the Archbishop of Canterbury. He didn't say Bishop Andrew. He didn't even say a rector. He said, I, Jesus, will build my church. So we are here because he has drawn us and he wants to build something in us and on us and through us. Coming back to the psalm, verse 5 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are are set on pilgrimage. Psalm 84 is often described as the pilgrimage psalm. It's sung as praise by those who journeyed towards Jerusalem, where the temple was, and it's a psalm that reveals the true heart of a true pilgrim, someone who has Jesus as their destination and goal in life. Of course, you will say to me, Libby, but when the psalm was written, they didn't know about Jesus, um, and that's true. Um, what the psalmist so longed for in the Old Testament was just a precursor to Jesus. That It was when God dwelt in his temple, in a physical building in Jerusalem, and the psalmist had a long physical journey to go and be near to God, to go to the temple. Whereas our pilgrimage, our spiritual journey now as we follow Jesus, is spiritual. Jesus is our temple. And as we follow him on that journey... He transforms us. Look back to that inter, uh, interaction between Jesus and the disciples. We're repurposed and our destination and call changes. After seeing the Lord, Peter, Simon Peter as he was then, um, had his name changed to Peter. Jesus changed his name and he said, you are Peter, the rock. His whole purpose and destination had changed as he saw who Jesus was. And similarly, as we see Jesus as Lord, Jesus remakes us too. He sets us on a new path with him, with him as the Lord. And it's why being a follower of Jesus has never been and will never be just an add-on. Do you remember my Lego tower from a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? It's not like just sticking on a different color that represents Jesus on the side of our lives. It should color the whole of us. Church, for some people who just stick Jesus on the side, we just do church when it fits with our busy diaries. And then the rest of the week, we might live exactly the same. But when we recognize Jesus as Lord, as Peter did, everything changes in his presence. Our destination, our whole being is different with him and for him and in him. Just over um, 10 years ago, a friend of mine found himself um, bored in church. I'm sure you've never felt like that. Um, he said he was cruising. I'd been a Christian for a long time since he was a young boy. And, uh, but he said his church life was just bland. He just turned up when it suited him, if he was honest, got less and less. And he gave little and he received little back. Um, he had a really successful job. Really good salary, so very happy uh, sort of life on the surface. Good money, good holidays, good home, all the stuff. Um, but his faith was making little difference. And then one weekend, uh, reluctantly, uh, he agreed to go to a service. And it was um, being led by Pete Gregg, who founded the 24-7 prayer movement. 
And while he was there, God spoke to him quite dramatically. Um, Pete Craig, leading the service, had no idea um, who he was talking to when God gave him a word of knowledge, which was basically very specific details. He said, someone here, and he laid out the specific situation that my friend found him in, so specific that he couldn't deny that it was him. And as he described this situation, my friend said it, it, it was just as though sort of like the Lord's presence just landed on him. That woke you up, didn't it? You haven't turned me off now, Dave, have you? Sorry. He was being called out. God just broke through and interrupted his life. And his call upon him was to start being church, living as though he was really a Christian. And this desire that's in Psalm 84, God renewed it in his heart. So this expression, my heart and flesh cried out for the presence of God, was how he felt in that moment. Just turned his life on his head and he wanted nothing more than Jesus. So he called him to be church. He actually called him to a new church. Um, He repurposed him to be all that he had called him to be, all the gifts, all the resources, all the things that were in him, just like we all have them within us. He called him out to use them for the kingdom. And it was transformative for my friends, um, absolutely transformative, not just in how he engaged with church, but for the whole of his life. He came alive, overwhelmed, overjoyed, um, and alive in Jesus. He committed, he started getting involved in worship, eventually started worship leading, stepped into serving. He offered himself to take uh, positions of responsibility. He brought his gifts into that, which were amazing. His time, his money, his love. He spent time with people he would never have imagined in his job and situation and status in life that he would spend time with, um, and it just transformed him. His work and family life, I have to say, was phenomenally busy. He traveled a lot overseas quite often, very busy life, very demanding position. But God honoured him with his time as he chose to give God the best bit and not the leftovers. Who do you say I am? Jesus had asked him in that moment. And he saw Jesus afresh, turned his heart upside down, turned his life in the church upside down. The philosopher Kierkegaard, after finding Jesus himself, wrote this. He said, now with God's help, I will become myself. And that was my friend's experience. And can be our experience too, may already be our experience, that when we see Jesus, we are repurposed with him firmly as our destination. And with that repurposing, it doesn't just put us to work and want us to bring everything to church. He also pours out blessing in abundance because the church uh, is, uh, we are the blessed people. Psalm 84 again, verse 11 says, the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. To set your destination as Jesus as Lord, is to know his blessing, his goodness, as we just sang. It's to know a God who pours out his goodness into our life, pursues us with it, as we sung. The church should be a place where blessing and favor overflow, where his transforming love works miracles in all of us, with love and healing and kindness and provision and grace and strength and all the whole lot. It flows to us, We're blessed people, but also should flow through us as well to bless each other, sideways relationships in the church family, and then out the door, down the hill, and all over Farnborough and beyond. It's amazing also to see how it is to share those blessings. Psalm 84 again, verses 5 and 6 says this, is blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The valley of Baca uh, was an actual place, is an actual place probably, uh, but the word Baca means weeping. In other words, it's used to describe any difficult or painful place in life where everything seems hopeless. And it's an astonishing thing, isn't it, that as we pass through those hideously dark places, even though circumstances can be dreadful in our lives, To know the Lord's presence with us is a blessing. And through his presence, he turns our dry and arid and desperate places into places of springs. 
That's what it says in the Psalms, because of his presence with us, his goodness overflowing to us. But even more amazing than knowing that ourselves is that if we allow his blessing to flow through us, then we can witness and be part of this amazing dynamic that sees those fresh springs of life burst into the life of others who are desperate and struggling. And what an amazing gift that is to be part of that in the Lord's kingdom, to play our part. What a privilege, what a gift to be able to know God in that way, to be able to serve him and share that, those springs of life, living water with others. Through our ministry with seniors, for example, those whose valley of Baca may look like loneliness and dreadful fear and isolation. Those through um, Acts 4, 3, 5 or, or Cap where the valleys of Baca may look like financial desperation and fear. All those through uh, cafes like the hub that we heard about earlier where young families are coming in, some families really struggling, or through toddlers or our ministry in the town centre where we meet people whose lives are right in that valley of Baca, overwhelmed with darkness and hopelessness, however it looks. We're so blessed to be overflowing, to have something to give to a hopeless world, to be able to bring hope and streams of living water, pools of life to those who are empty and dry. So a question for us all, and I'm asking myself this question as well, it's really challenging. How are we, how am I, how are you involved in overflowing his blessing to others? That's your homework, to think about that. Is that part of your life? Have a little pray about it. That is our call and purpose and privilege as a church. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, the psalmist writes. And it's really interesting to me as I've sort of flicked open the commentaries on that psalm to see that the authors associated with Psalm 84 are the sons of Korah, I'm sure you're familiar with them, part of the Levite tribe. They were set aside for, for the service of the Lord. These are the people who served God, who knew God so intimately. They were in charge of worship and works of service. And so perhaps there's a little thing there, something that a little light goes on, definitely in my head, that says maybe as we serve, as they did, being part of a church, receiving, blessing each other, blessing those beyond the church walls. Maybe we too will grow and know and enjoy more of the Lord's presence with us as we see reflected in the hunger and thirsting in this psalm. To be able to cry out as they did, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. They knew that there was nothing in the world like being with the Lord and part of his plans and purpose. And so today, Vision Sunday, there's always a bit of a challenge, always a bit of an encouragement. Um, as we hear again the Lord's call to us in this season, it's a call to press in as disciples of Christ, to be repurposed as we reaffirm together, reaffirm together that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our Lord and Lord of our lives and that we live for him. To a call on our hearts to be fixed on pilgrimage, to seek him and serve him and journey with him. And a call to share his blessing as we go, seeing the goodness of the Lord flowing to us and through us and bringing his transforming water to parched lives as we go. Just to end, I love the message translation. Sometimes it just cracks it open in an amazing way. <coughs> Losing my voice. Um, this is from the message, bit of Psalm 84. God of the angel armies, O God of Jacob, one day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. I love a Greek island beach, quite frankly. But this is better, the Lord's presence. It says, I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be, an honored, than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. All sunshine and sovereign is God, generous in gifts and glory. He doesn't scrimp with his traveling companions. And that's exactly what he's inviting us to be and to commit to, his traveling companions traveling with the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray together and commit this to him?
Heavenly Father, we fix our hearts on you, on pilgrimage. Jesus Christ, Son of God, you are our reason for being and our life's destination. You are the one we worship. Would you continue to repurpose us, transform us, and use us for your, your glory? We are your church. We choose to follow you, worship you, and serve you with our whole lives. We are here for you, Jesus. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.